Welcome to the Force and Friction podcast, your go-to show for the latest RevOps strategies, discussions, and interviews. Welcome to the Force and Friction Pathfinders podcast. And as part of our Nearbound series, in today's show, we welcome Bernard Friedrichs, the founder of Partner Standard, uh, originally from Germany, but based now out of Valencia, Spain. Welcome to the show, Bernard. It's great to have you, and we appreciate your time taking uh, appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure being here. It's like we've been talking several times. It's really nice to to be on this podcast right now. Um, yeah, super excited. Oh, for, awesome. For seeing awesome. What comes next. Well, I know you've done your homework because you're very efficient like that. Uh, and you know we always start on the Force and Friction podcast with the uh, one-line origin statement. And I know as a background, you've got nearly 20 years, over 20 years experience in partnerships. Um, Bernard uh, founded Partner Standard, um, an organized part, uh, you know, and, and you know, to help businesses thrive, really. But what I'm really interested about Partner Standard and that two decades of experience in that origin is what's the sort of story behind it and maybe share with us the vision you had when you first launched it yeah so well my, my origin story and i was thinking about it how how to, <laughs> to go into this one and well what i can say um it was quite a journey to make it to this podcast here today speaking about business partnerships um well as, as i said like I, I started in germany um very close to the border with the Netherlands. Uh, this was also with the Netherlands where I started to, to study in uh, international marketing. And, and it was like from there, actually, it went really international. So I, I, I worked in, in a Spanish company right after the study, or actually during the study already. And the food business sector is where you have high competitive uh, prices, a lot of suppliers, and you learn to negotiate pretty well with a lot of aspects and costs that can come. And then, yeah, I was helping there to open the Northern European markets like UK, Ireland, Denmark, Australia, uh, Austria, and uh, um, Denmark. And, and after this, like a little quick six months in Argentina, I oh, moved wow. then to Paris and started to work in the SaaS industry. And there I was tasked to open the German speaking markets. Um, it's very exciting if you look from an outside perspective to your own people, you learn a lot about your own culture and how to enter the market. And after a while being there, I moved then finally to Germany back to Berlin, um, where I was living then the last seven years, again in the SaaS industry and helped a company to expand this time really to North America, Europe, and finally Asia. And um, a blast like we were growing massively and a lot of uh, partnership driven actually and then when when i decided in 2021 that i you know it's time i want to build my own business and i realized it's time like you know after a while you want to do something on your own and i think like I, many people during covid had similar thoughts and started to to look into this i actually realized that i built a career all the time based on developing ecosystems and partnerships worldwide and I realized that's a lot of fun. I mean, it was called sometimes uh, area manager, business development, uh, very, very late stage, it was called partnerships. And I thought I want to continue this. And I realized all this way, there was not a lot of resources, advice or mentors available. Uh, and I thought, okay, I'm gonna start something where I can actually help businesses to find some guidance and real advice to, build partnerships, um, especially also in, in the sector of SaaS, which was is relatively new and you, you can't find so much, you know, frameworks and, and actually, uh, the, yeah, really advice and, and, and sources to look at. Okay. And, and that was the key idea starting um, um, the business um, to, to help businesses. Yeah. yeah, and it brings you to today. And um, if you want to learn more a little bit about um, Bernard, you can head over to partnerstandard.com and uh, please do check out his knowledge base as well at pro.partnerstandard.com. It, it's quite extensive. Uh, of course, connect with uh, Bernard on LinkedIn uh, as under B Friedrichs as well. Uh, and for those of you guys listening on the applications or the mobiles, we'll put all these in the show notes. And of course, um, you'll be able to get these at force and friction podcast.com. Will you be able to watch this interview as well? So let's just talk a little bit more about Partner Standard. Obviously, you're coaching um, founders, professionals to grow the business through effective partnerships. 
Um, I know you share a lot of insights and best practices and things like that, podcasts, publications. Um, and one of the things that you don't know too much about with Bernard, he's been referenced in uh, in the Nearbound book. That's how we got the rise of the Who Economy, which I would follow. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, and Jill Rowley, who's going to be guesting on the podcast soon as well. Uh, I think it's August the 2nd. Um, but also, Bernard has been listed among the top uh, 117 consultants and agencies for technology vendors, distributors, and partners of all types. And that's published by Canalys as well. Um, so this Quite a bit of background here on partnerships, and I can see obviously why you've you've arrived at that point. You know everything, especially in the food and uh, you know and hospitality side. That, that's a, a very low margin business for sure. Um, so you've got to get that negotiation right, as you said. Um, but you know from that side, let's just talk a little bit more about that near bound because that's where we met to start with. Um, mm. You quoted in the near bound book um, with Martin about the four C's methodology. Um, and I was intrigued when I read the book because you talk about um, you'd got three of the C's right, but it wasn't until that fourth C dialed in um, that it really started to click and understand with partnerships. So tell us what the four C's are um, and just give us a short summary of why these four are so important to make partnerships mm -hmm. work. Yeah, so um, actually the four C's is a method really grown out of, of experience over years that we did. And it was a lot with, with Martin that we exchanged and we looked, hey, what are the patterns? What make partnerships actually you know, successful? And like among all the partnerships that we did, which are the good ones uh, and what do they have in common? And, and so we discussed um, and we had, you know, both our our um, yeah, experience in this. And then we came up, okay, actually you can, you know, dis distill this in, in four C's, which is always comes to the same points, which are first you look, of course, if partners have a similar customer base, it's customer base number one. So you look, if they have like the customers where you look into want to reach in, either you, you don't reach them yet, or these are your customers that you have and you want to expand there to yeah, increase the reach. And um, the second one is, um, capabilities. Um, so that is basically where you see like, um, is the partner equipped to it? Um, do they have uh, the capability, the sales team? Like you want to enter the enterprise team, but the partner only has an SMB sales team, which is different profile of people uh, just from close, from the negotiation, from the contract. And so, or, or the invoicing methods or whatever, like their kind of capabilities is always important. Even though it looks like great, they have access to the customer base, capability can be wrong. Um, then it's credibility. Um, and there's one thing where, yeah, you can um, basically have the same customer base and the people sell this, um, but still people like clients would not buy from this guy, this product, from this business, this product, because it kind of is not right. Or you would not believe that this company would sell you a digital product. It's like the same thing. You wouldn't go to a butcher to buy a loaf of bread. It's like, it's, you know, the butcher has the means to sell it, the same customer base, but something in the air doesn't smell right. Yeah. And so that is that is the thing of the credibility that is not working there. And then you have those three, but finally um, is commitment. And the commitment needs to be there. Only if you tick like all the four, like there can be some weakers in some, especially when these are new partners that are starting to grow and build it. But if they have a lot of commitment, they can still make it. But if commitment is not there, uh, it doesn't it doesn't work and that really comes from from one thing is partners never partner because of your objectives with you they partner with you because they have their own objectives and that is where their commitment comes from and so you have to really qualify and see if you have aligned objectives and if they bring intrinsically their own commitment with them Brilliant. and that is the four c's yeah. Brilliant. I can testament to this because um, having read the Nearbound book and using yourself and Martin's four C's credibility, uh, sorry, methodology, um, we recently got introduced to another HubSpot uh, partner who wanted to partner with us because they was getting suppressed in inbound. We know inbound's not working as well. Mm -hmm. um, and they wanted to access some of our RevOps services. And, you know, we've We've franchised in the past and we've agented in the past. So we've got a, an appetite to do that type, some form mm -hmm. of partnerships. 
And you know what? I thought to myself, I've got to put this into practice. Did they have the customer base? Yes, they had SaaS and tech companies. Awesome. Were they a credible name in the HubSpot ecosystem? Absolutely. You know, fabulous. Mm -hmm. No problem. Mm -hmm. Did they have the capability? Well, not in all cases, but they would have needed some as assisted implementation. But as a partnership, we could have done a shared implementation. So again, and then they kept chasing. So I said to him, look, what we're going to do is I've no doubt about the first three. I want to talk about what commitment. How many people are you going to put on this? How many people are you going to employ? What financial or human capital resources are you going to put behind it? Suddenly, the calls went cold. Suddenly, I was chasing them. And when I did eventually track them down, they said, oh, yeah, it's not quite the right time. So I'm not sure if that was just a one-off situation, but the commitment to me was critical because I think they wanted to come in, do a smash and grab, not in a disingenuous way, but they wanted to come in and do a smash and grab, think it was going to be easy, and they weren't going to put the effort, they weren't going to put the resources behind it. And the commitment failed them, uh, even though everything was you know five-star stellar yeah. Uh, things. So I actually used it. So if you guys are out there thinking about, you know, joining partnerships, you know, all the information that Martin and mm -hmm. um, Bernard here talk about with the four C's is right, but make sure you do dial in the commitment because it, it saved us, Bernard, a ton of time, a ton of meeting time, you know, lost opportunity cost where we could have been investing that somewhere else. And yeah. uh, it was an absolute dream. It was so simple to, you know, structure in a professional way. And it what's we call weeded out the bad sort of opportunities. Not that the company was bad. It was just the opportunity was bad when it really boiled down to that commitment. They weren't prepared to put it in. And uh, we we dodged a bullet, as we said. So thank you for that. It really worked well for us uh, from there. But uh, if you want to learn more about the Four C's as well, you can check it out in the Nearbound book. If you guys haven't already got it, go and get the Nearbound book by Jared follow it's awesome it will really help you uh you know with this new movement that's happening thanks for sharing that bernard a couple of things before we get more into the the, the you know the transactional relationships uh, of partnerships um what i'd like to know is across that two years uh, 20 years two decades what would you say your biggest win is and maybe what is the biggest lesson that you've learned along the way apart from the commitment one uh which is uh we've covered uh, the the I think the the biggest win is like making it um, you know learning a lot of out of um, out of experience trial and error was at mm. that time the because there was not much of uh, of guidance especially in new sectors like you know just being realizing okay like making partnerships and also like partner experience everything we're partners in it's always about persons like your partner is never a business. Your partner is always the the other partner manager on the other side. When this person goes, the whole partnership is in danger. And I think like the the biggest win is like seeing through that it's that it's about people and the partnerships you do like value and creating these relationships um, through through that one. That is, I think, one of the um, the the wins to you know um, going through that. I even without realizing that. What I was doing at that time, sometimes early, is actually partnerships. It's like you go through, hey, you sell through a distributor or you sell through a reseller. But actually, you need to build like a partner program to get resellers and distributors. And actually, it was called business development. And then going through that with, you know, just figuring it out, finding out the right contracts, figuring out ways to to understand what is, how to qualify that. That, I think, was um, the, the biggest win. I think what are overcoming stuff is and that probably goes a bit later when I started to um to 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 build the business um and is is one thing is um when you build your own business um starting consulting like doing the consulting doing the same stuff is great but you also have a business that you have to run and and there's like I think Bill Gates said sometimes uh, like success is a lousy teacher so if you start with a big project in the beginning you forget about administration, marketing, sales. And then you run into this project and do all the stuff. And I think one of the things that I had to, you know, then go into and it took some while, even, even though you know it actually before, is like then going through all this other stuff of running a business, which, you know, took like then the first year to get this all sorted out that you also put your administration in place, get the marketing stuff right, um, and, and build also like, the sales uh, funnel for your for your own business and that was something that um yeah took took some time and then i think one learning as well 
um, especially in consulting and coaching business is personal branding is extremely important. And it's more important than you probably think then. It's um, something you can build uh, together, but you really need to look at because people buy you as a person very often. Like they buy your concept and your intellectual property, but there's something you need to start early and it's nothing that you can do fast. It's something that you need to build over time. And, and so that is something um, I think that is was learnings to, to do. Uh, and yeah, and don't waste your time with bureaucracy and taxes. Pay for people, pay for people, get that done. Also, another thing is like what I do, like as a coach, I'm also hiring coaches for stuff that I don't know because I really believe in that. And it really helps you. It really saves you actually money. If you identify some stuff you're not really good at, buy a coach, get yeah. the coach and, and it helps you really for your own business. Yeah. yeah, and it strengthens your team as well, doesn't it? Because if you've got yeah. a specialist in whatever subject and a different subject and an alternative perspective, you're learning, your clients are getting better way. So there's some great lessons. I really appreciate it. Um, Quick reminder, guys, if you want to check out more, head over to partnerstandard.com, uh, see what Bernard and his team is doing there. Uh, but again, big push on the uh, knowledge base, or the knowledge hub, should I say, uh, pro.partnerstandard.com. We'll put these in the links, uh, show notes, and in the uh, uh, website at forceandfrictionpodcast.com. So let's talk a little bit more about partnerships and one of the topics that we chatted about previously and was that collaborative versus transactional sort of style relationships mm -hmm. if that makes sense there's a million ways we could open this up but you know i think we mm -hmm. understand the core difference between collaborative and transactional um, but when you put it into the context of business partnerships does it change to what our common perceptions are and for the listeners who are thinking about this, you know, should they approach it differently or is it, you know, just unpack that for us a little bit more, uh, Bernard, please. So, well, I'm straightforward. I would say like most partnerships fail because the difference between collaborative relationship and transactional relationships is not understood well. Yeah. Um, and saying it this way, transactional relationships is you exchange, like you do a transaction, you exchange a product or a service, which is the value, um, against money. Yeah. And you do this exchange and that's it. That needs a completely different kind of relationship between a buyer and a seller. And that is sales. And a collaborative relationship is actually what is partnerships. Um, and the moment when we try to transactionalize partnerships, we make them fail. Um, and that is, I see is, a, a big issue and that I mean keeps me luckily busy um, is um, is that I see there it's like it results into the wrong way how you onboard your partners because you need to still onboard them like an internal employee in, in, in many cases um, the the way how you treat them over time the way how you measure success what are the KPIs like you see partner managers being measured on on revenue KPIs while they not even sign one single direct client contract in their career. So how do you do that? So that there's like a lot of lack of knowledge and understanding collaborative relationships, which is, I think, kind of also uh, okay uh, for now um, because I think partnership, you know, that's it's it's starting more. We can see that now. Technology is there to uh, facilitate collaboration. Worldwide, globally, communication makes it easier. SaaS technology is there that goes into it. We have some pressure for partnerships um, because we, you know, interest rates are increasing. We need to get capital efficient growth because growth yeah. at any cost is not a concept anymore. We need, yeah, profitable and capital efficient growth. And um, so there's like some pressure for partnerships. And we also, to, for businesses, the world is getting more complex. So one company cannot develop all features required by a client and also cannot um, serve all channels where they could go through. So they need channel partners, they need technology partners to basically um, stay competitive. So there's like a lot of pressure and partnerships is here to stay and will grow. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, one thing that we have right now is like a lot in leadership teams, um, in the recent years, there was like a lot of, or in the, yeah, the last decades, there was like a lot of experience and background in transactional relationships. That is how economy worked in that way. And now what we just see is like more and more, 
lead us going into with a background of collaborative relationships to understand how that actually works and, and understand this, um, you know, the curve on, in partnerships is rather like a hockey stick while direct sales is going the <laughs> other way. Yep. And, and that is something that means like you need to trust in partnerships and you need to have some experience in this. Um, and that is why I think there's just, just, yeah, it's like, like an idea that time has come right now, partnerships, because it's everything is, it's not a new idea, but it's an idea that time has come. And, and that is where I see collaborative relationships and definitely understanding the differences of that we don't fall into the old pattern to try to transactionalize partnerships. That means yeah. also partner tech. You see like a lot of partner tech that tries to do things, partnerships on making it on autopilot. That's not working. It's like, also, it's great AI is there, which is really cool. And what gives us, it's a really chance to actually make more space to, for, to automate all the tasks and give more for space and time for the people that are actually working on the partnership, the new things, the creative stuff. So, and, and that is just about to come right now. And that is, I think, yeah, finally saying like collaborative relationship, people should put more focus to really understand what's the difference towards yeah, transaction. No, that's, that's a great overview. And thanks for sharing it, Bernard. Just just one thing as well, hot mm -hmm. off the press this week when this podcast is being recorded, uh, speaking about Nearbound, back to the Nearbound scenario, uh, Reveal and Crossbeam have yeah. just uh, merged together. So that's what a hell of a collaboration. I think there's about $150 million of venture capital money across the two, um, you know, coming together from that side. I understand it's maybe a different type of collaboration, but you mentioned the tech there. So big congratulations. Yeah. Uh, to all the guys at Crossbeam and uh, Reveal over there for getting that done. Definitely couple of quick like, ones. Yeah, a couple of quick great ones. Great teams from both sides. Oh, yeah. 100%. Amazing. A couple of quick ones I want to throw in. Um, when it is. I know in your knowledge base, uh, Knowledge Hub, um, you have so many different things like uh, the, you know, we all know what a persona is. We all know what an ICP is, ideal client profile. But you guys have drilled it down now to ideal partner profile, so an IPP. And that's not something that is as as obvious as, you know, global language. So I, the importance of getting an IPP, you know, when you break down the demographics, psychographics, technographics, you know, and all that type of stuff of a, of a persona, is the IPP much different to an ICP? Um, what are the key differentiators that you look for when you work with your clients? And, you know, for the listeners, if they're thinking, oh, I've never thought to create an IPP, what would be the key components? I know they can go and get it on your, on mm -hmm. your site, but just share with mm -hmm. us quickly what that yeah. uh, looks like. Yeah, so I, I think like one thing on an IPP is important to understand that. So likewise, as an ICP, you have the, the, the filmographics, like the business itself, like what is the company build off? And then you have the persona. Uh, and on the persona, uh, one thing on an IPP is, uh, which helps a lot to really figure out that you don't start from scratch and see if there's uh, experience, first of all, in partnerships. If this company that you're working and this person right there has actually um, the, the the capabilities um, and also can bring commitment and can you know has the has the has the reach um, to commit to that partnership and and work in this and it's like is there a partner manager on that side yes. um, do they have experience in working with partnerships do they understand the different kind of partnerships we are talking about with um, is there an executive sponsor um, because if you do a partnership Major. and, Major. and you are just that you are just hanging down somewhere at like kind of the somewhere in the in the last corner of the sales department uh, and try to push through some some deal that that is not going to work so where is actually this person located um because you know um partnerships is not the ugly cousin of sales it's like it's an own department it's an own that has a reach in through product has a reach into marketing and sales and actually is is kind of um, a lot of more impacting uh, than, than we think. And so also what we have to look into is like, do they have an infrastructure? Can the people um, um, basically provide for partnerships in, in, the, in, the, in the way that is needed? Um, and actually, you know, all that, what you go through in the partner life cycle afterwards um, with the different phases from recruiting to onboarding to growth uh, and, and evaluating the partnership, it's important when you look in the in the ideal partner profile that um, you be very precise with that persons. Can you can you go through these circles? Because partnerships means like 
two people walking in the same direction for a while and they keep exchanging all the time. It's not like you just go through a transaction point and then go. Like you go for a while in the same direction. So you need to be very, is this ideal partner the one that I that I need? One thing there is, I would you don't always need an IPP. No. Um, sometimes you can work as a company and you say like, we just want to look for a few strategic partners. And they are so big and they are so strategic for us that you have like a custom search. You actually only need an IPP when you say like, okay, my 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 target group of of or the target list of potential partners is so big that I can actually apply clusters and filter them because I want to have a scalable partner program and I have potentially like a thousand, two thousand, three thousand partners um, that I can address. And then you have an IPP like as a filter to search for the best ones. But you can also start a partnership initiative and say like, I actually want globally four big partners, which are my strategic OEM partners. Yeah. And then you do just the custom research and you don't need an IPP. Brilliant. Thank you for clarifying that. And again, on the Partner Standard website, we've got quite a few resources here. Um, and these are all free for the listeners to go uh, and get. There's uh, partner types and categories. So if you're thinking what types, it channel partners, mm -hmm. you know, or various things. Uh, there is even like a 21 slide deck uh, open source on about a partner strategy map. Uh, you can also get a nine slide deck on uh, the IPP or the ideal partner profile that uh, uh, Ben had just mentioned there. So head over to Partner Standard, uh, have a nosy around, you know, there's some links in the fodder. There is the pro uh, knowledge hub there as well. Um, a major, you know, too much free really uh, there for you. you know, there's some paid assets there I think people would be happy to pay for. So get some value there before Bernard gates that and uh, get on there so uh, joking aside it's, it's credit to you buddy you, you put a great deal of you know free helpful knowledge out there um and of course if you're interested in working with a consultant please reach out to bernard at um on linkedin so you mentioned also about in the earlier about the trusting collaborative relationships um it, you know Yes, you may go through the partner strategy. You may or may not do the OM partners or the part IPPs. But is there a different strategy or an obvious strategy you'd recommend for building and maintaining trust? Um, you'd mentioned earlier, like, is there a partner manager? You know, have you got a sponsor? I'm guessing they're all contributory mm -hmm. factors. But, you know, we talk about trust is the new currency, you know, in, in, mm -hmm. in this decade. Partnerships, trust, people buy from people they know, like and trust and, you know, you know, the surround themselves. I spotted Jay McBain and Jay was saying, you know, about I identify the six of the seats that surround you via and things like that. Um, so talk to us a little bit more on your view about building trust in those collaborative relationships. Um, and what strategies you recommend to get them set up and expectations managed? And then how do you maintain that, you know, whether that's your KPIs or, or whatever? Tell us a little bit more about that. Um, well, I, I think, I mean, it also comes back to collaborative relationships and what belongs mm -hmm. into this. Um, trust is um, because it's it's people doing business with people. It's not a automatizable, uh, what's that, a German word? Like, it's like you cannot <laughs> automate that. Um um, uh, so that you just have two robots discussing a partnership with each other. Yep. So you really need trust between people. Um, and um, so the point that you, how to do that is it's very early it starts. It actually starts before you start the partnership. Yep. Is What you have to do is really on trust is to be uh, transparent from the beginning in, in things that you like to have in that partnership and also being very, very direct with what you don't like to see in the partnership. Um, and that is, I call that exit triggers. Like you yeah. need to mention the exit triggers in the evaluate in the in the qualification process. You need to speak be before you sign an agreement, you go um, and can sign off a, a mutual action plan, which is yeah. really good to test the commitment. Um, and then you basically say what you what you expect and what you don't expect. Um, and so what is very interesting is when you speak about the exit triggers, what you don't like, it, in, it actually improves and enlarges the partnership because there are no surprises. Yeah. And you can trust that if you don't do that, then that worst thing doesn't happen. And so basically, um, trust is one thing starting very early 
in the recruiting process. Um, and then also going from there through the onboarding phase where you can see how actually, how they deliver on a mutual action plan. And how do you um, basically get your business activated on that partnership and, and your partner as well. And another thing is like in a partnership, you have a partner and you have a partner. You don't have a buyer and not a supplier. And you don't treat your partner like a customer because that makes you a supplier. Yeah. Um, and so basically it's also kind of, you are really able to ask for your, like your partner for a specific, you know, stuff need to be done uh, in the partnership, like your expectations that you set out in the mutual action plan. And um, because you have also the right, if it's, you know, it's not customer as king, if you, it's the partnership, both have equal rights in that one. And you have to have, you have the right to ask uh, for, to fulfill on the mutual action plan. And that is where, you know, the trust comes. And then the thing is like, like in a, in a human partnership is, uh, the really quality of their partnership comes in bad times. When something happens and how you solve a problem, um, then you can really see how stress test proven this partnership is. And, and, and how strong it's going to be. How strong it's going to yeah. be, yeah. Uh, do you yeah. have your back? I think it, it goes back to in business. You talked about earlier about don't forget to do the business things as well, you know, about, you know, getting your marketing funnels open, your administration and um, it's also understanding what time you're in. You know, there's a, there's a great exit. You can search it. For the listeners, you can search it online. Just search wartime CEO and peacetime CEO. And it goes down the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the role of a CEO when there's a recession or a downturn in the economy. And that's the wartime CEO. You know, it's, it's a different set of skill sets than if it's a peacetime CEO where the waters are calm. So I'm guessing it's a similar type of example, Bernard, where partnerships are doing great when everybody's meeting quotas and that trust is building. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're going on their golf days or annual awards evenings. But when the chips are down on one side of either, you know, not intentionally, but, you know, maybe fallen short or under delivered, that's really where that partnership should step in. And would you say that, you know, if, if it is at the fault, I don't I'm not a finger, you know, pointing or blame proportion person. But if it wasn't the fault identified at one side, would you expect the other side of that partnership to step in and help dig that out? Uh, and as a joint rectification, is that the sign of a good true partnership? Or do you think it's stronger where the partner at fault raises the hand and said, I'll put it right regardless of cost and, and time, you know, or is there a, a, maybe a hybrid in that, Bernard? Where do you see the best wartime partnerships, as I'll recoin that phrase, uh, being successful? And well, without doubt, you're sitting in the same boat. Uh, you help each other. Like I, I, the strongest partnerships I made over time was when there is something wrong, and you know, even if it's the fault of the partner, you you will help, and you go through that, and you, it that pays back in because there will always be another time. And like without doubt, you go through this and help. Uh, because you are both sitting in the same when when this part when your partner has a problem and then problem with your client you ev eventually have a problem so you are basically uh figuring that out together there's there's absolutely no doubt in that one that you yeah brilliant brilliant before we wrap up um but it's been a pleasure speaking today and i've learned so much uh, okay, as well um Tell us just a little bit about Partner Standard, how people can work with you. Uh, obviously, they'll set up a consultation with you or something, but is there like a framework that you'll take them through? I mean, I can see it on the strategy maps, but, you know, for mm -hmm. the people who maybe don't have the benefit of listening back to uh, watching this back or, uh, you know, not maybe not in front of a, uh, a PC or a computer at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. What's that framework or process that you take people through um, that gets them from zero to partnership hero, if mm -hmm. that makes sense? You know, just share a little bit about what Partner yeah. Standard does. Yeah, so Partner Standard is, in in short, has um, I'm I'm a coach. I'm coaching uh, people that professionals partnership or professionals or founders that want to uh, learn more in partnerships, and that is for for start and scale, like for SaaS businesses, uh, but also um, everything related for enterprise, which is then going into ISO 44001, yeah. which is a, the standard for partnerships on for, for bigger enterprises. And um, I do consulting, which means like, that is more like helping a business um, in this way that I'm 
usually my clients come and either have, well, they have a running product, they have a, a well, product market fit is there, they have a go to market and they want to expand. And so um, they want to have a consultation, which can be a monthly consultation or can be wrapped up into a project, which is usually between three to six months, yep. where we then see, okay, we're going to do first an assessment to figure actually out what is the partnership readiness of that business and what kind of partnership types they actually should go with and which are the business objectives and what are the partnerships objectives that feed into this business objectives. So really having a, a way, if there's an operational fit, the product fit, the market fit, fit, if the leadership team is ready for that, and then building a partnership strategy. And when that is running, setting up the partner operations, which goes through a partner life cycle and really setting up each point to make sure you have a great partner experience on each of the touch points that you have in the partner life cycle. So it starts with a assessment all the time. And it's also what I do when, when companies call me uh, to figure out, is it now the right moment to start in the partnerships? Uh, are we, you know, did we tick the points to, to go there? Usually you can go into partnerships very, very early, more early than you think. But sometimes some stuff is just not there yet. Um, and then kind of this we figure out in an assessment. And then we can can you know, basically explore uh, what needs to be done, um, what, what, what timeline you have, and how you can basically achieve your business goals with partnerships. Yeah. And, and last is um, yeah, the Knowledge Hub, where I actually share content. Um, and there's more content to come, I can tell you, like more, um, <laughs> more. stuff that you can read, um, more stuff that you can listen to and that you can see. Um, there's um, definitely more in this direction. And, and so basically you can also knowledge up because that is one thing that triggered me a lot when I started Partner Standard is that it is so difficult to find reliable information. Um, there, when I when I started, it was like a handful of books. Now we have like Nearbound book and we have like, uh, a lot of other books that we that we have right now and 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 the ecosystem that grows book as well and so there's like a lot more information but compared to sales it's like there's not really a lot that we can see. single percentile um, isn't it compared with marketing and sales books out there so uh, yeah. it, it's it's there's a lot of things to be done that's awesome final question Ben, before we let you go um for a business today, let's let's assume it's a, a, a more smaller, a non-enterprise, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, enterprises will have analysts and they'll have resources that maybe some of the smaller SaaS and tech organizations don't have. So if we're looking at one of those smaller businesses, looking to establish strong partnerships, um, getting started the right way so they don't start off wrong. Uh, what mm -hmm. key advice would you give them? You know, what would be the first thing that you would be doing for somebody, you know, so I'm a CEO, I'm a, SAS, a founder of a SaaS tech company. I'm thinking like, wow, this partnership looks good. Yeah, sure. I'm going to head over to uh, Bernard's site and we're going to look at that. But, you know, if you were just sat having a cup of coffee with something and you could share mm -hmm. one pro tip with them about the number one thing that they should be doing to start out of the gate right, what would that be? Um, look into your business objectives and look um knowledge like get knowledge about the different partner categories and partner types and see if those can help to achieve your your business objectives mm -hmm. and then make sure that you and that's you have to look into if your company is actually compatible with the needs of those partners yeah. um what you can do there is you can do like a, a partner readiness check actually you can also see one in um on, on my website um, and then go through and see if your business is ready for that one. Um, what I what I would do is like, there's one thing that's very important. Make sure that the leadership team is on board. And that's probably the one single advice that is the most important one. Is like, you cannot do just something with partnership. Like partnership is a leadership task because it goes deep into your organization and you have to make sure that your partnership team, uh, your leadership team is knowledgeable, about partnerships and committed to go through this um, partner, the initiative and the and the questions that will come up there. So that is brilliant. Say. Yeah, because I mean, ultimately, what you're saying there is this is going to be I wouldn't say fundamental, but you know, it's it's going to change the way that the business operates, its services. It's going to require resources and investment if it's a true partnership, and if the leadership aren't on board, then you know. 
we have a saying that it's trying to push water uphill. You know, it gets very, very, very difficult, you know, if, and, if you don't have those senior people involved. And, and, and one thing is like, um, it's the understanding that actually partnerships is pretty capital efficient. It's, it's compared to uh, yeah. traditional go-to-market models, it's, it's really capital efficient because you can grow, you can innovate your business, you can expand in different areas, in different industries with partners uh, in a much more efficient way than you can do that probably directly uh, mm -hmm. with your own resources and learn it on yourself. Um, so there's one thing is like the, the knowledge that it is capital efficient, just that you need to act a little bit different than you would do it out of your first reflex. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. Again, guys, if you've enjoyed listening to the show, um, head over to partnerstandard.com. Don't forget to check out the Knowledge Hub at pro.partnerstandard.com. It's an absolute treasure trove of resources. It's going to really help you sort of get a baseline and, and you can connect with Bernard on LinkedIn under B. Friedrichs. Just give him a search. Bernard, it's been an absolute pleasure hosting you. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And my knowledge on partnerships continues to grow as a result. Thank you for your time today. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, we stay in touch. It uh, was a really absolute pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. And for you guys out there, we appreciate you've got a lot of choice on the podcast market. Thank you for lending us your ears and listening. Or if you've been watching this on the Force and Friction podcast.com, that's great. We appreciate you being part of the GTM and RevOps life. And as I said, all the links that we've mentioned here, the, the the knowledge base, Bernard's uh, website, his LinkedIn profile, and a couple other partnership resources. I think, like we mentioned, the IPP, we'll put those into the show notes at forceoffrictionpodcast.com. So have a great week, guys. Thank you so much. And we'll catch up with you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Force and Friction podcast, produced by the 1630 Digital Team. To find out more and access the resources discussed in this podcast episode, visit forceandfrictionpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to catching up with you in our next episode. This podcast and associated supporting content is published under copyright to 1630 Digital. All rights are reserved and no reproduction is permitted.